Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk and part two of what is prehabilitation, the Q&A session. It follows on from a talk given by Mike Grocott called What is Prehabilitation? And it's a Q&A session with our distinguished panel, which last week, Denny Levitt gave us some of the names of. Just have a quick listen to that again. Linda Dennehy, respiratory physiotherapist and academic respiratory therapist in Melbourne in Australia. And this is the grandfather of prehabilitation medicine, Frank O'Carly, who leads prehabilitation service in Montreal in Canada. And Herrett is a colorectal surgeon who led the International Prehab Study, Netherlands. So that's the panel, speaking with Mike Grocott and, of course, Denny Levitt, Professor in Perioperative Medicine and Critical Care at the University of Southampton and a consultant in perioperative medicine at Southampton University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Have a little listen to this. And then I think there's a popular question from Malcolm West. What is the definitive trial that needs to happen to accelerate prehab implementation. It needs to include mechanistic work, I think. Malcolm, where are you? Um, hi. Yeah, whatever's happening, you know, with the large multi-centre, you know, Herrick can talk about that trial. My question back to you would be, do we need to look at each component of prehab or do we test it as a package of care with ERAS? I honestly think we've done loads of trials over the past 10 years. We've probably done uh, more than enhanced recovery combined. And the focus is is on all of the things that the commissioners wanted us to do. The, the challenge, I think, is even if we show that there is mechanistic value in tumour outcomes, I'm not entirely sure it will accelerate implementation on the ground. So is there a trial that anyone can think of that could accelerate particularly a, a multi-continental implementation pre out I think you need to find one sick politician. <laughs> Generate a good story and get him to talk about it in the house and it happened overnight, which is slightly flippant, but actually I think having gone through this pre as Franca and others on the panel have in various other interventions, it's as much about politics and policy and swaying people as it is about data. The data is really important, but the stories are arguably more powerful and if you can sway the politics the job's done. There's another problem with if you would do the ultimate trial and you would include 10,000 people in your trial and your outcome would be fantastic then still the financial matter wouldn't be solved. It's a positive business case and then the insurance companies will say well we don't have to reimburse the hospitals because they'll make money out of a prehabilitation program anyway. And the internal financial aspects won't change within the hospital either. So the discussion will remain the same. And as a surgeon and uh, you're looking through literature, you want to reduce your complications. In the beginning, we would focus on surgical techniques and find solutions that would reduce your complication rate by 5% picking up other techniques. And now we focus on, not on the quality of the surgeon, but on the quality of the patient. And we see publications with a reduction of complications in 20 to 60% of the patients. And we have a hard time adapting these procedures for prehabilitation. So I think even if you have the ultimate trial, it will not change the discussion. It's a bit depressing. Ross, did you have a question? Ross Kerridge uh, from Newcastle in Australia. Mike did comment to me, in the, so I've got Phil, I've got to respond. I really liked your presentation, and I think much as it should be a continuum, from a practical and pragmatic point of view, and particularly in terms of getting it across to the CEOs, I think trying to have a more limited scope for prehabilitation does make sense. And I was looking quizzical when you were saying that, but I get your point, and I think you're right. And now for the off the wall comment, because ultimately prehabilitation should be part of a continuum starting at the shared decision making and working all the way through to post recovery. But I think, much as I agree with limiting the scope, something that should be in scope. And I think is an underlying issue that we have to deal with societally that, to my perception, we're about in the transition when the people who were alive and conscious before, say, the invention of penicillin or the end of World War II are just about to pass from the earth and our health care is going to be dominated by the baby boomers and the baby boomers 
people a bit older than me and, and younger, have a great problem that they've never come to terms with the fact that we're going to die. <laughs> and I think part of prehabilitation is going to have to include the skills to confront people having the existential crisis about they are going to die and that maybe living with cancer uh, is something that they have to come to terms with. And just because they've been given a label of cancer doesn't mean that they have to have surgery and treatment to fight it and kill it and coming to terms with that. And I think baby boomers have grown up knowing that it's all about them and everything should be about them and they should live forever and we can't do it. And somewhere in that prehabilitation progress is going to have to be learning the skills to deal with that. And I think we're doing it anyway, probably unconsciously, but maybe we need to be more conscious about doing that and even feed that out to the community as something that you've got to get used to and that cancer isn't a death sentence, it's just something that you live with, particularly with some of the treatments that they've got now. It's amazing. Anyway, I don't know how you'd fit that in your limited scope, <laughs> Oh, and I always thought you were a baby boomer. Well, so another one. What's the magic spiel to convince surgeons to send us patients at least four to six weeks before surgery and not when they book the case for the following week? Herod, over to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, but did you... So basically in England, what we, ha we struggle, or certainly many people struggle with the fact that patients are referred very late because it's not the surgeons in the UK, certainly, or in Australia, as far as I understand, that are driving the prehab agenda. So the perioperative prehab teams are trying to find out about patients, but are only finding out about them immediately prior to surgery. And that's quite frustrating. So how do we convince you to send them earlier? I get it that you don't mean the delay before referring to a hospital, but the delay uh, after the diagnosis to... Yes, or from referral to listing. The time between referral and listing we introduced a prehabilit uh, prehabilitation program and found that we had to delay surgery for about one week to have a program of at least three weeks, mostly four weeks. But since we were done with the international trial, prehabilitation became regular care. And then things really changed. Our endoscopists do all the workup and all the workup is done within a week which was uh, at least two weeks faster than before. So we created a window of opportunity to do the prehabilitation. And in Holland, it's not the surgeons that refer patients for prehabilitation, but it's actually the endoscopist. Those are the ones that find the tumors. And since prehabilitation is so integrated in the pathway, they tell the patient after the endoscopy, sorry, we found something in your bowel. It might be a tumor potentially to be operated and your whole workup will end with surgery, but your program will start with improving your condition. So actually from the day diagnosed, patients are informed about the prehabilitation program. After the MDT, about a week later, the day after they will be at the physical therapist for their first check-in. So that's a way to shorten the interval between the start of the program and surgery, at least referring patients at the very first yeah. instance. I'm very interested to hear you say that because that's exactly where we get the patients in Southampton. What I would say, because you were talking about the colorectal cancer pathway, where pathways are very tight because there's not a huge amount of neoadjuvant treatment, whereas, for example, I can see an upper GI surgeon right in front of me, you've got 50 weeks of neoadjuvant, so you've got plenty, you've got a bit more time. But it's about, if you were in the prehab service, to my mind, what we spent a lot of time and sounded with the trials early on is mapping the pathway. And if you don't, unless you understand how a patient ends up on the operating list and what the process is and what proportion of referrals end up on the operating list, it's impossible to get patients early. So in colorectal, the majority of your patients that have a tumor or an endoscopy will have an operation, all things being equal. If you went for all of the HPB referrals, only 8% of them end up having an operation. So you would completely overwhelm yourself. It's not that it's bad for the patient, but that's why we say to people, the delivery of the prehab is not that hard. It's finding out the patients, but you can only find, that will be different at every trust. So you need to work out how they get to the surgeon, what happens next, how long it takes to get to the MDT. Can you get them straight from MDT? Can you get from endoscopy? Everybody who has an endoscopy in the UK, you can't have a CT without a UNE. So if you're going to have a UNE, you can have a hemoglobin and then you can start your anemia management. But lots of people don't realize that. But prehab is for any kind of pathway, even if 
in the end you are not treated surgically, you will benefit from a program. Yes, point where we haven't got resource trying to do 90% of non-surgical patients, it overwhelmed us. On the other hand, you have a condition like lung cancer and you want to operate these patients within three weeks at the max. One of our PhD candidates, uh, David, sitting over there, he uh, did a pilot on a program in lung cancer patients and they all had six physical training sessions before surgery and they were able to improve their physical condition even in a program like that. So it's the, the joint effort of all these pillars of prehabilitation that can make a difference within two weeks even. So, Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on the panel? I, I just want to say that I mean, we don't have the endoscopies uh, like uh, you decide also because it goes to the tumor board. And then the tumor board is the one who actually decide uh, to some extent uh, the type of uh, irrigation. So, but definitely we get the surgeon. And the surgeon, I have to say very much that probably because we work very much with the surgeon with the heiress, uh, definitely they're already open to consider the prehabilitation. This is for colorectal, I would say for lung. For lung, we're much more lenient in a way because we concentrate very much on those who actually do a, a neoadjuvant therapy. So we start prehabilitation immediately as soon as they start neoadjuvant. And now, because there's a lot of work on immuno and neoadjuvant, definitely we intervene very early and on this patient stage two, stage three. So I would say that to me is very important because it saves the time. For the other one, I think stage one, generally we don't necessarily see then if it's necessary, unless there are, of course, a referral. It's a referral list with the indication when to, to send to us. I don't think we are really worried about whether two weeks or three weeks. I think there's plenty of evidence, to some extent, on the biology of the tumor. So the surgeon will otherwise indicate to us how to proceed in terms of timing as well. So I think there is very much latitude and that respect. Obviously, I'm a physiotherapist, so I can't speak for other centres, but at Peter Mac, the anaesthetists certainly drive prehab, but the surgeons actually refer through the electronic medical record system. And certainly we have data, and Hilmi Ismail might present this, of it does peak and trough a little bit, so the surgeons do need to be reminded around that. It's not a, an opt-out only, so opt-out would be the best way to go, but they actually are still referred. But we don't do too badly, but I don't know about anywhere else. Excellent. Thank you. Put a question from Helen, which I've now asked here. We talk about hard outcomes. I think people mean clinical outcomes like complications, but the benefits, the psychological and empowerment components of the benefits for patients seem to be being overlooked, even though it's very consistent. How should we value these more? So, so where they will play in is uh, in quality of life metrics, which will contribute to the cost effectiveness calculations. You know, if you're weighing cost on one hand and effectiveness on the other hand, and you've got survival, the quality of life weights the survival. So if your quality of life's improved, that should be convincing, but it may not be convincing to an individual trust. At a system level, it denotes, you know, that value. And it's good for patients. I mean, it's harder. The empowerment thing is very hard to quantify or turn into a business case. But as you commented, the power of the story in support of the business case is very important. And then there's a question again about the start and end points for prehab, particularly in non-surgical populations. How do we, should we define when we start and when we stop, or does it really matter? Should it just be a continuum? A start and the stop of the program. Actually, we would like to change the world. We would like to have everyone on the globe in a better condition, physical and mentally. But we are restrained by resources by doing this for our patients. And whenever a patient comes to the hospital, we should pay attention to his physical, mental, and metabolical condition. But we lack the resources for that. So we have to limit us for patients that we treat and we are actively involved in and can budget-wise also guarantee. But actually, the process starts at the instance a patient uh, hears of the disease. And the endpoint should be way after recovery. But we focus on the period before the operation. And if you have a multi-model approach, uh, let's say breast cancer, most of these patients are too young women. They have a whole procedure which lasts for a half a year. 
uh, starting with chemotherapy for uh, four months and then an operation and then radiation. And if you don't intervene, they will have lost a lot of quality of life and a lot of physical fitness after six to nine months. So there should be an intervention for actually every patient that has an attack to their physical well-being or well-being in any state. So the beginning is when you come to the hospital and the end is when you're fully recovered. But we don't have the, the luxury to focus on the complete episode. It would be really nice to have that support to continue with rehabilitation after prehabilitation, so after surgery or after a bone marrow transplant or whatever to actually continue, but we obviously don't have the resources. So when patients have prehabilitation, it does empower them to understand the benefits that they get from the exercise, from the change in diet that I don't think we've measured it, but I think carries over into the post-op recovery phase. And while it would be good to be able to do more then, I think it does make a difference for patients just having that prehabilitation through neoadjuvant or before surgery. And maybe we need to be then saying to patients with breast cancer, we have this e-enhanced program online for you to do, to continue. And maybe we need to be looking toward that sort of thing afterwards that is more based on the patient driving it themselves. I guess what we're actually doing is remediating a failure of public health messaging or adoption in a system where most of the money goes to the hospitals, that's where we intervene. But in the perfect world, everybody would turn up fit and well-nourished for surgery. We just, we don't currently run our society like that. Yes, I think that is true that there are some patients when we screen them and so on, probably not necessarily need, or they can be, can be sent to a class, or information class. So that's where the, the screening could be useful also. So concentrate very much. And also at the same time, there are patients who don't respond not necessarily to all the what we can do. Uh, when I say responding in terms of uh, classifying what we think are uh, the targets, what we expect in the targets, in terms of uh, uh, strength, in terms of uh, nutrition, for instance, and so on. And they so necessarily, I don't think this is a failure. This is a recognition that definitely, biologically, there is a 20-30% of patients do not respond to medication, even if you give a normal medication, pharmaceutical medication. So I would say that we have to accept that. But overall, as Linda said, there is definitely this sense that we want to make sure that they continue after. And although we cannot try to continue to monitor, we generally monitor up to eight weeks. And after that, we create a liaison with some community center for cancer especially, where they can go for free distance to continue some uh, activities. Could be uh, massage, yoga, uh, nutrition classes, and so on. So I think that would be useful to think about where we can actually send and establish some, uh, I would say, liaison with all these group that we can actually continue that. Because the patient, they ask, what are they going to do now? And that's what we have been establishing slowly, slowly, community in different parts of Montreal. From the behavioural change perspective, if you want long-term behavioural change, it's better to establish something that the patient can continue afterwards, which is the advantage of it being delivered not in the hospital but near their home. Because there's much more chance that they may continue to go to the gym they've been to do their prehab if it's around the corner, whereas if it was in an hour's drive away, with hospital parking, the minute it's over, they're like unlikely to go back. So, I mean, there's lots of data and behavioural change about that. So transferring um, continuation of exercise is dependent on the patient being engaged in it and it being easy to do. Well, that's something that's important. So I think we've got time for one more question before coffee. And I know Hilmi's been waiting to ask. So Hilmi's the back there. Uh, thanks. Hilmi is my from Melbourne. Thanks for your, your talk. I think the question of defining prehab is really crucial. And the question is really about pharmacological interventions. I've found that there are a group of patients who will not be able to be prehab if you don't get their pharmacological status optimized. And a case in point is severe intractable pain that has been poorly treated or heart failure, toxic tachycardias from chemotherapy. 
So I really would like to know from the panel what they feel about including pharmacological interventions as a part of prehab in order to define it. So I completely agree with the proposition in the question. There are undoubtedly, so there are patients that anemia management may facilitate rehabilitation or management of cardiovascular or respiratory disease, but I think that's using a different type of intervention to facilitate prehabilitation. I mean, it's just a a personal view, but there are a number of reasons why they're they're administered differently. The patient's relationship with the treatment is different. The characteristics of the treatment are different. Who who does it is different. For me, that's a useful categorization, but it's not a, there's no, uh, in here, to be discussed, I think. It's a bit like the health optimization and optimization of comorbidities. We have, in theory, been doing for more than 20 year, years, and then prehab has got added in. And now the reality is, I think, in the UK, a lot of the time, certainly, we were seeing patients so close to surgery that we weren't optimizing their comorbidities. And one of the advantages sometimes now of seeing them earlier is that if their AF is poorly controlled or they're anemic, we can also now actually finally get to optimize those chronic health conditions. But that is a chronic health condition optimization, which is Mike says is slightly different. And if you put that all in, the intervention becomes so massively complex and unwieldy. If you're going to have diabetes optimization, cardiovascular AF, anemia, that it becomes difficult to test or evaluate. And it's also quite a different workforce sometimes. So I think it's massively important they're done in parallel, but I don't necessarily think it's the same people or in the same place even. Particularly if you're doing community delivered prehab, you're not unlikely to be the same people delivering that in a gym as will be optimizing their AF management. That's not to say it's not important. That's sort of how I think of it. Apart from the different type of anemia, I think it's the duty of every physician to treat anemia. We don't need to wait at the, the pre-op clinic or the surgeon or the endoscopist should treat anemia. Okay, but in that case, if really, from the point of view of rehabilitation, anemia is so important because you cannot exercise patients with anemia to don't really try to intervene at the same time. So I think we can be involved, we are involved. But to me, this is a really a deficiency from the physician point of view. Any physician should actually treat anemia, first of all, when it's evident, obviously. Completely agree. It was 2017 that uh, Franco and I and the other members of the consortium of the international trial decided to keep patient blood management out of the trial and talk about a four-pillar program instead of a five-pillar program because we see that anemia correction is a a far too important uh, pillar uh, not to give to the control group. Because the, uh, if if you want to do a prehabilitation program, all these factors work together. If your hemoglobin rises, you are in better shape to 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 exercise and so on. So um, we thought uh, patient blood management was so important to leave it out of the trial. Thank you. So we've run over by a couple of minutes. I think we're going to draw a session to a close and thank all Mike for a fantastic lecture and to the panel um, to their contributions. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now